This is Matthew Cratter from Trader University, and today I want to answer the question, why is Bitcoin so volatile? We've seen some big moves in the past few days. We moved up from uh, north of 58,000, and we moved down from there down to about uh, $44,000, $45,000. For those people who are not used to normal free markets, this looks volatile, but this is actually what a real market should look like. There are no circuit breakers. It trades globally, it trades 24 seven, and there's no way for outside parties to intervene. It's a truly free decentralized market. I would also point out that Bitcoin is very volatile because it is still in its startup stage, even though it's at about a trillion dollar market cap. For a currency, this is still a startup stage. For Obviously for a, a company like Facebook or Google, a trillion dollar market cap is the sign of a much more mature company. But when you're thinking in terms of global uh, currencies, the size of uh, currency markets and fixed income markets, etc., a trillion dollars is really still a drop in the bucket. To give you an idea, the US, uh, or the, I would say the global real estate market is about 100 trillion. So we're still just at 1% uh, of that value. So Bitcoin is volatile because it is still in a very startup stage. Only 2% of the world's population owns Bitcoin now. And what happens is normally when technology is developed, it's developed by private companies that then go public and issue their stock to the public in an IPO or a direct listing. And so a lot of the volatility of startups gets hidden. You try to have these, uh, you have an angel round or seed round, family and friends, you have a series A and a series B, etc. And a lot of the volatility that's uh, inherent in starting something new gets dampened or not reported simply because in private markets, there's a lot less trading. And when there is trading, they try to always do it at a higher and higher round. But you can do a thought experiment and ask yourself, what if you were able to get real-time quotes on Facebook from the beginning? If you go back and rewatch the social network, the movie, and then <clears throat> excuse me, also think about what happened after that, all the volatility before it became public, and even when it became public, when it IPO'd, it crashed for a while, and then they came out with their mobile advertising and it went up a lot. And so when something, uh, also obviously Facebook was closed on weekends, it didn't trade completely globally, it didn't trade for 24 seven, but this is what a new technology looks like, and there's perfect transparency in Bitcoin. There's always this talk that whales can manipulate it. Sure, if you're a billion dollar seller, you can manipulate it for a very short period of time. You can dump it and drive down the price. Uh, but of course, if you wanna buy back in, you're gonna to have to move a billion dollars back in. And people really underestimate how much money can be made by doing this sort of thing. The real whales are the ones who bought early and held and were, uh, were hodlers. And so Bitcoin has this, this radical transparency where in real time, you can see what the global market thinks that it's worth. Now, Bitcoin itself, the protocol, the network, the open source software is very steady and it's not volatile at all. It keeps producing a new block every 10 minutes. This is what miners do. Never changes its monetary policy. We have these halvings that happen every four years. We know from now until 21, 35, whenever it is that the last Bitcoin is going to be issued, we know exactly what the monetary policy is going to be. Right now, the, the minor subsidy, the, the block reward is uh, 6.25 Bitcoin. This will be halved in four years from now in 2024, and then it will be halved again in 2028, etc. So it's not like trying to guess what, what uh, Jerome Powell is going to do or what his successor is going to do. Bitcoin is very steady. It just does what it's been doing for the past 11 or 12 years. And we know its future monetary policy. Monetary policy is a huge, has a huge impact on currencies. And so the fact that we know that, that Bitcoin is very scarce, there are only 21 million Bitcoin, and we know the is issuance path, we, knew the, we know the, the future inflation rates for the money supply of Bitcoin, this is extremely, extremely helpful. And there's nothing volatile about this. What's very volatile is 12 people sitting in a room, 12 central bankers getting to decide everyone's future. And you can be sure that they're not making these decisions with the common person in mind. Whereas Bitcoin is radically 
transparent. And also, even if you are a whale, no matter how many Bitcoin you own, you cannot change the rules. You cannot tr change the uh, software. This was tried during the Fork Wars in 2017 when a lot of miners and big whales got together and tried to force something on the network, tried to force larger block sizes, and the network, everyone involved in the network, uh, rejected them. And so this is one problem, obviously, with proof of stake, like Ethereum is moving towards the more uh, the more coins you have, the more coins you can earn, etc., and the more you can influence uh, policy. But with Bitcoin, you cannot change the rules no matter what. Bitcoin has also survived every attack. You can be sure that the CIA has tried to bring it down. Uh, Trump told Mnuchin to go after it. It's been attacked by foreign governments. It's been attacked by domestic governments, by hackers who want to steal the Bitcoin that's just just transparent to everyone that's sitting there in these public addresses, 500 million here, 2 billion there. You can steal it if uh, you can hack the protocol. But so far, the protocol has attacked everything. So Bitcoin, uh, I, I would say, I'm sorry, uh, the, the protocol has survived every attack uh, by everyone. And in this, in this sense, we can say that Bitcoin has the biggest bug bounty of any project in the world. If you can hack it, you can make yourself a few billion dollars. Obviously, it hasn't happened yet. And the higher the hash rate goes, the stronger the network becomes. As the price goes up, the more of an impenetrable fortress Bitcoin becomes. Bitcoin network has had something like 99.98% uptime much better than any other network in the world. Bitcoin's price has been volatile, but most of that volatility does skew to the upside. So the real risk is being short Bitcoin or not owning it. This is something that will go up 300%. No one will comment on it. And then when it falls 30% or 20%, Peter Schiff will come out and say, I told you so. Meanwhile, Bitcoin has moved from a couple hundred dollars when he first got bearish on Bitcoin to north of $50,000 as we speak. I would also suggest that volatility in itself is not a bad thing. For one thing, volatility allows people to cost average into Bitcoin and to buy dips, etc. Uh, it's a very fair form of money distribution where if you have very strong hands, if you have diamond hands, if you really understand the technology and if, and if you put in the work, you have a real advantage over everyone else and you're not scared by the, the volatility. So for example, yesterday and the day before, I was buying more Bitcoin, not scared at all, uh, sleep like a baby at night when I hold my Bitcoin. Now, Nassim Taleb has a great analogy for the difference between volatility and actual risk. This is the, uh, the famous turkey problem from, uh, I forget, it, it was in his uh, in the Black Swan, I guess. So the, the thought experiment here is you think of a turkey, its life has been very non-volatile, very easy, it gets fed by the farmer every single day of his life, and he's never died yet. No one's ever done anything bad to him. So if you're, if you're doing a trading model based on this, you would suggest this is a very stable asset and that this turkey is going to have a very stable life whereas if you if you uh if you scroll back and think about it the turkey is going to be slaughtered sometime a couple weeks or a couple days before thanksgiving and the vix for the turkey basically will be going from zero to infinity the risk the volatility go uh, goes up massively and anyone who's standing back uh, far enough away can see the big picture involved. The low volatility of the turkey's life up until that point uh, does not carry forward. Likewise, you should be very scared of stable assets or assets that appear to be stable, especially if they're being stabilized by central banks or by governments. The famous example where George Soros broke the pound peg uh, by shorting it and uh, the, the, that peg was very stable until it broke, and then it broke, uh, it broke massively. Bitcoin itself uh, has had the fastest time to reach a trillion dollar market cap of anything. This is a little bit misleading since it is built on top of the internet, but Google took 21 years to hit a trillion dollars. Amazon took 24 years. Apple took 42 years. Bitcoin took just 12 years. And what I think is really interesting, and I'll link to this, is that Bitcoin adoption is growing much faster than the PC or 
the internet. So we're still very early. If you're listening to this, don't worry about Bitcoin's price. It has gone up a lot, but you're still very, very early when only 2% of the world's population has, uh, has bought Bitcoin. If you're finding this video helpful, I'd encourage you to hit that subscribe and hit that like button. Now, when people talk about Bitcoin crashing down as it has the last couple of days, it's fun to, to think about the fact that it's actually crashed down, quote unquote, crashed down to two and a half, 2.25x, 2.25 times its previous all-time high. So its previous all-time high from 2017, early 2018, was 20,000. And in this sell-off, we crashed down uh, to uh, $45,000. And so this, this is how Bitcoin works. It is volatile. But if you're a long-term holder, these crashes don't really matter simply because you, the, the price of Bitcoin gets so far away from your, uh, your purchase price or your cost basis that it becomes much less painful. Those of you who have been following me for a year or more know what it's like to have a cost basis below 10000 and in some cases below 5000 I think uh, Vijay uh, Boyapati makes a good point here where he talks about in the last bull market in 2017, which was, uh, I would say, more volatile, whenever you had a sell-off within the context of the bull market, the market stabilized after drops of, call it 30 to 40%. He's hypothesizing now that it, the market uh, finds, a, finds a bottom after a 15 to 20% drawdown. What we've seen so far, that moved down from, call it 58,000 down to, to uh 45,000 was a 23, uh, 23% drawdown. What's different now is in 2017, there were a lot more retail traders, and now there are a lot more institutional uh, investors, like Squares, we're going to talk about, who have been buying the dip. And this really <clears throat> helps to dampen the volatility of the asset. So it seems volatile. It's still very volatile by the standards of other asset classes but this volatility is going down over time. <clears throat> Many of you asked me to talk about Yellen's warning about Bitcoin being extremely inefficient. This comes from a person who has done nothing for the world except print money and have very loose monetary policy. Uh, I think she's a, she's a terrible person, absolutely terrible person, and we, can't, we somehow can't get rid of her. She's at the central bank and then she goes to the treasury and uh, she has a lot of nerve to uh, criticize Bitcoin, in my opinion, especially when she says that it's a very inefficient way to conduct monetary, uh, monetary transactions. And when she says it's a highly speculative asset, uh, here's the quote, it's a highly speculative asset. And you know, I think people should be aware that can be extremely volatile. And I do worry about potential losses that investors can suffer. This is a chart of uh, purchasing power. This is somewhat, I would say, understates the loss of purchasing power. Nevertheless, you can see that if you just held a dollar, what it bought you in real world terms has gone down over time. This is the real problem with fiat currencies, especially when you have people who like to do a lot of quantitative easing, people like, uh, like Bernanke and Yellen and Jerome Powell. Also, when Yellen talks about uh, Bitcoin being very energy inefficient, for example, this is what uh, this is what Bitcoin energy efficiency looks like. You have a bunch of uh, Bitcoin miners. The way the U.S. dollar is uh, energy efficient or inefficient is you have lots of giant aircraft carriers that drop bombs on people, kill a lot of uh, women and children in the process. So for someone like her to criticize Bitcoin when she's completely destroyed the dollar with her money printing. And to ignore the fact that the biggest user of crude oil in the world, for example, is the U.S. military. U.S. military is used to keep the shipping channels and the trade channels open. This is how the fiat system works. The nice thing about Bitcoin is it doesn't require all of these bombs and all of these aircraft carriers, which are obviously not that great for the air or for the environment. I like this quote from VJ again. Uh, Janet Yellen needs to apologize to Bitcoin holders for her fiat privilege. That's a pretty good, uh, pretty good hashtag. Powell, in many ways, is much more honest. In his testimony, testimony yesterday, he said that there's definitely a link between Fed liquidity and asset prices. 
obviously there is. This is why the stock market is pumped and Bitcoin is pumped uh, during a, a time of very uh, sluggish economic growth, all the problems with the pandemic and the lockdowns. And yet we're close to new highs on the S&P 500, the, the QQQs, Bitcoin, etc. Of course, there's a link between money printing and asset prices. And this is what we've been talking about. And this is one thing that uh, Yellen doesn't, um, doesn't mention when she criticizes, criticizes Bitcoin. When you print a lot of money, you increase wealth inequality in a very artificial way. You pump up asset prices. And at least, uh, at least Powell has the, uh, the honesty to admit it. Or maybe he made a mistake when he admitted it. Final news here, uh, Squares announced yesterday that they purchased uh, more Bitcoin. They previously purchased about $50 million worth of Bitcoin. This time they bought about $170 million worth of Bitcoin for their balance sheet. And uh, that's approximately 3,318 Bitcoin. If you calculate the average price they paid, it's about 51235 per Bitcoin. So Square, Jack Dorsey certainly think that Bitcoin is still a good investment even at these high prices. If you buy Bitcoin now, you can get it for about $2,000 less than Square paid for their coins if you want to talk about uh, deep value investing here. Finally, a, uh, a somewhat unrelated tweet, but I just thought it was really good, so I wanted to share it. This is from Mr. Mr. Steal Your Sats, Your Satoshis. People pay the excessive costs for college to receive a piece of paper, obviously a diploma, to make depreciating paper, to earn fiat dollars, which lose money over time because of people like Janet Yellen and, uh, and Jerome Powell. Other people learn digitally. In other words, you learn online, you watch YouTube as you're doing now, and save in digital money, hopefully Bitcoin. Natural selection unfolding, scary stuff unless you're on the right side of history. For all the people who are paying $200,000 uh, for four-year college, it is something to consider uh, you always have to consider the, uh, uh, the cost-benefit analysis. And if you can take that money instead and put it in Bitcoin, uh, it may even have a much higher ROI than, uh, than a college degree. Obviously, this will vary for individuals, but I think it's important to realize that you have different paths and you don't necessarily have to do what everyone else is doing. Maybe, uh, maybe there's even a way to take out a college loan and uh, somehow funnel a bunch of it into Bitcoin, something to, uh, something to consider. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.